for almost um, one and a half year. And I hope that we can repeat this sort of educational thing for uh, improvement of all of us, including care to our patient. Now, um, we are going to talk about the nature of the pain and pain management as general. But um, I, I, and I like it to be a discussion rather than a monologue. So, um, uh, some, does somebody want to now comment on that? Um, that when was that, for example, any of you had a pain of eight, eight, nine, or ten of ten? Because that's the rank of pain that, in my practice, I usually deal with. And usually, at the time, at the time the patient comes to me for some sort of treatment, that's the range of pain you're talking about. I know Adam, Adam, have you ever had a pain of uh, 7, 8, 9, 10? Dislocated my shoulder. Dislocated the shoulder. Musculoskeletal severe injury. And who else want to share us uh, maybe a pain level of this range? Anybody? Shattered my ankle. Shattered the ankle. Labor. Yeah, yeah, what's labor? Though <laughs> there is a very specific thing about the childbirth, and they have done studies about that. Women tend to forget how painful it is later on. Otherwise, no woman would have two children. <laughs> Nature wants us to just spread our genes. So, now, a general question: Can everybody agree in this room that the pain is a bad thing? Who thinks the pain is a good thing? Excellent. I agree with you. I second that. Because look at that. This is a, when you do not have pain. This is a toddler at the age of two years old, or somewhere between two and three. And you see the tip of the fingers are missing. This is a genetic abnormality with pain receptor are missing. We're going to talk more about it. They don't learn from traumatic events. And this is what happened. By the time they are teenagers, most of these kids have lost their feet and their hands because, again, they touch something hot or sharp and they don't learn from it. Now, I want you to have this picture there. And then let's talk about what pain really is. Pain is just a, just a signal. This is, it's in, the physiology of the pain is no different than if you touch something or see something. That's a signal that something is happening. What happens is that, does this have a laser? Probably not, but what happens is smoke alarm goes on and the information gets carried along our neural pathway to our brain and brain interpret it. And we react to it like anything else. Now, as an organist, we are going to protect ourselves, and that's what the pain is, <coughs> protect ourselves. Now, noise of a smoke alarm, pain is not the fire. Okay, so how does it work? We have receptors in our skin, or our inner organ, or our joint, or <coughs> in different areas of the body. When we come to my area, I will explain it to you that bone itself doesn't have a pain receptor, but there is a periost membrane over the bone which is extremely pain sensitive. Or the joint capsule, they are very pain sensitive. That's why shoulder dislocation is so painful. The pain signal goes over different fibers depend on what kind of uh, uh, signal it is. Goes to the north uh, 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 root ganglion it crosses at the same segment and then goes up. And if we continue this, it goes up and you see it passes through certain structure. We will come back to some of it. And by the way, you don't need to memorize this. <laughs> I, I need to know all of this, but for, I think what you need to know is that it passes through certain structure until it passes through tal thalamus. And then at that level, it sends signal as a sensory uh, signal to our cortex, to our brain, as well as it connect to certain limbic structure. That's where we get our emotional response to the pain. Now, you can argue, what is really pain? Is the pain just a signal, or is it our emotional response? This is a huge question in the neuropathology and neuropsychology. 
Now, emotional response. Now, I'm just going to go over it very quickly, but there is a very uh, well described circus, uh, circuit in our brain that um, practically make us react certain way to certain stimuli, and pain um, is one of them that has a very strong response for a good reason. Now, I'm just going to tell you something about how we can we can we have ways to influence that response. There's a procedure I have done seven of it, and it's in the I, I did it when I was in the residency, and it's a, in the group of psychosurgery. Everybody has heard of lob lobotomy, right? It's a bad thing. The reason why it's a bad thing is because in the lobotomy, they go up here and disconnect the entire frontal lobe. There are multiple ways of doing that. They, as a matter of fact, they did used to go through the upper membrane of the eye, go to the frontal lobe, and just disconnect everything. Now, what we did with singlotomy, instead of separating everything, we connect the single gyrus, which is right here, and we did it mostly for people who had OCDs. But as well, some of those patients had severe 10 of 10 pain. And as soon as we did the singulotomy, when you would ask them, do you have pain? They would say, yes, my pain is 10 of 10, let's go have a coffee. <laughs> they separated the emotional response of the pain from the pain itself. So let's go back now, um, forward. Now, chronic versus that's another very important distinction, uh, something that we need to distinguish and differentiate. Chronic versus acute pain. I want you to just look at, oh, no, that's. How do I activate that? Well, it doesn't want me to show it to you, I guess. But what you would see here is that a, car, a, a cattle is being branded. It's very painful. We can agree on that uh, being branded is very painful. But the cattle just walks away and a minute later start grazing, have a normal behavior. How would a human being do in that situation? If somebody would hold you down, brand you, and would you just stand up, go, and just do your normal behavior? We probably would not do that. What I want to tell you is that the chronic pain is specific to human beings. Animals don't have it. It has no function in animal world. But we internalize it, and we react to it in a very different way um, now, and I will come back to that, why it is. It, lots of it is feedback that are uh, making themselves uh, independent. And then the chronic pain has become real pain, even though it has no physiological function for us anymore. Okay, I know that you know, uh, my back is hurting. I know it's something wrong with it. But why do I have to have for years, 10 years back pain? But uh, we will come back to that. Now, nociceptive pain. This is the real pain. This is something is a horse is on fire. Smoke alarm goes on. Do something about it. You have a, a wound. Your hand is burned. Your, bo your bone is broken. Your shoulder is dislocated. Now, but on the molecular level, this is the way it works. Again, you do not have to know this, but at the end of the day, there are multiple cascades that happens depending on what kind of injury it is. Um, and mostly it runs over arachnoid uh, acid that it gets uh, transformed to other uh, material, other signals, mostly prostaglandins. And then these are material that at the end stimulate and start the signal of the pain. Now, pharmacology, at any level that something is getting transformed to something else, we can intervene. And we have our aspirin and non steroidal working mostly here and here. And we have uh, lots of other medication that can modify or interact with this cascade. We will come back to that. And this is a, uh, just a count of things that can activate the nociceptors. We looked at that. This is right down of the previous slide. So we have globulin and protein kinase, arachnoid acid, that's a major factor. And uh, aspirin blocks, as you see, the conversion there on the uh, COX, uh, the, that's the cyclooxygenase uh, uh, 
uh, protein. Histamine interact with that, and nerve growth, even nerve growth factors uh, interact with that. Um, substance P, P uh, and calcitonin, they modify potassium. If there is a tissue damage, there's lots of potassium in the tissue, obviously that will um, react with that. And even the lactic acid and muscle spasm, you know, obviously lactic acid, muscle spasm, your muscle is at the border of what it can do. You need to stop. And unfortunately, people all listen best to pain than anything else. So pain is to make you stop. So neuropathic pain. Everybody has heard of that. You know, gabapentin neuron is such a common medication these days. What is neuropathic pain? Neuropathic pain is when the, literally your receptor or your nerve are not really working well and they are sending the wrong signal. They are sending the signal of the smoke alarm even though there is no fire there. What about the psychogenic pain? Do you, everybody sees the house on fire? You still see the house on fire? Okay, now, is it real or is it malinger? It is not malinger. Once the pathways are there, that is every little bit real as any other pain. Meaning that, you know, still it's a disease. We, and we have to deal with it as a disease. We should not deal with these people as people who are, you know, try, just trying to move the system and treat it as such, okay? Once the pathways are there, remember this. Once the pathways are there, it is real. How do you know I am real? It's all in your brain at the end. It's like Matrix, like, like the movie. It's all in your brain, okay? So, what's a phantom pain? Phantom pain is you already have remodeled the side of the house, but you damage the cable on the wall, or you're uh, confusing the smoke alarm in the other room with the one that was there, or your computer is broken. That you're feeling a pain that is not there. Why is it important? Because who thinks that everything that works on the cyclooxygenase would work here? It wouldn't, because it works on a different level. Opiate, where do opiate work? Opiate work on the computer. In the central, it's a, it, they work on the central pathway. Can they work here? Yes, they can. But <coughs> we talked about the neuropathic pain. This is kind of neuropathic pain. There are different medications. We will come back to that. That work at different places differently. Well, we talked about um, the pathway of the pain. Any place you produce the signal in that pathway, for starting from your hand all the way to your brain, every time you push on these this fibers, your brain refers that pain to where that nerve is originated. Doesn't matter if I do it here, in the arm, in the spine, and that's, that's where I come in play. Most of the time what I treat is people coming with the pain in their extremities and I treat their spine because that's usually where the, um, something is pushing on those nerves. No, there is a very nasty disease. It's called the uh, Dejerin-Rossi syndrome. Again, you don't need to know that. We know it for 100 years. We know it from people who had a stroke, and all of a sudden, they are in horrible pain. Well, they had a stroke in their thalamus, and they have a short circuit on some of those pain uh, cell pathways, which now they, have, they are referring it as a pain in their extremity. Very, very nasty disease. So. And I'm, I want to show you another um, MRI. This is a syrinx. Who knows what's a syrinx? Can you explain to us what a syrinx is? Well, it's a deformity on the right side. Right exactly. The Actually, right side and the left side are the same. This is a T2 and this is a T1. In the T1, you don't see the cavity. If you look carefully, you see it. And here's the syrinx. It is, when we are born, there is a, a small tube inside of our spinal cord. But then that obliterates pretty much at the time of, around the, just around the time of the birth. But in some, in some situation, it doesn't. And in some situation, it opens up. And then we have certain, something that from inside pushing out on all the fibers. 
and some of these people have really horrible pain because something from inside is pushing on them. So this is just an example of no matter where the pressure is or stimulation is, you will refer that as pain. It's very interesting if the, you remember we talked about that, that the pain signal crosses the midline segmental first before they ascend. If something they're pushing on the right side, people have pain on the left side. Does that, these things make sense all of a sudden in that setting. What is the treatment for that? For the syrinx, I, we go in, we decompress it. We put a small shunt, small tube that drains that material out. So, I want to go very quickly over some of these things because I think they have clinical relevance. Um, everybody knows aspirin, and it was it, it is still very effective uh, drug, but we don't use it very often because it works on other supply oxygenase. You know, nature repeats its pattern. It is not we don't have supply oxygenase only in our uh, receptor for pain. We have it in our platelets and. Uh, Aspirin actually irreversibly block the cyclooxygenase, and meaning that it permanently disabled the platelet. So sometimes you use it just for that, people with heart attack or stroke and so on. But generally, aspirin is not used for pain anymore because we have things that works better on the pain receptor. And if you remember the very first, uh, one of the first uh, uh, slides that we had this cascade um, that at the end end up with prostaglandins and activate the pain system. Most of this, what you see here, act, at some level block that cascade. Aspirin, ibuprofen, everybody knows that, naproxen, and uh, then the other group of medication. Indometacin is uh, less these days uh, used for uh, uh, pain, for, is used for other because inflammation and pain our body react to them to the, in the same way. And some of them, they act on other part of that cascade that it's more toward the inflammation than the pain, for example, in the medicine. Ketrolac, everybody knows that we will talk about that more. Diflofenac, excellent medication, but it's not used anymore, that often anymore for same reason, because each of these enzymes, they happen to be in other part of the areas. And side effect profile is sometimes different. Then um, I'm just going to uh, go to the next slide. Okay, we talked about it. Uh, this, is, this was on the receptor side, generation of the pain. Now, modif pain modification, opioid, you know, morphine, dilaudid, fentanyl. We react to them because we have a receptor for it. What means at the same time, we have an internal um, protein that actually looks the same. We call them uh, you know, endorphins. This is something our body produces to activate those, the same receptors that morphine binds to. What they do, they modify our pain level. And this is an internal, um, like, I would compare it like you go and you um, adjust the level of the noise in your, in your alarm system or who should react to that. You put the number who should be called and who should not be called and you adjust sort of how to react and how uh, transfer those information in the central nervous system which includes spine and the brain. Um, and these are the receptors. It's a, it's a complicated thing. There are multiple different receptors at different levels and each of those uh, medications react differently at a certain level. And at this point, maybe we should talk a little about PCA, because I think it's a very powerful uh, way of treating the pain, and I will come back to pain medication. But I think it's, uh, things that are important to me with the PCA, first of all, we talked about the, how it works. It modifies the pain perception and modif modifies um, how it's transferred to our brain. And the idea that the patient can control itself, the you know, pain medication, it's very new actually. You know, the 10, 15 years ago, we uh, wouldn't have the idea. We thought uh, actually that just the professional should be in charge of that. Um, it is extremely effective. Um, and 
lots of these questions are uh, philosophic in nature, but um, almost all my patients have PCA. Now, question basal rate, no basal rate, I, and people go back and forth regarding that. In my, in my practice, I do not give basal rate because I want the patient to be awake enough to push the button. And they can, they can push the button as often as you, they want. We know that the PCA gives them the dose that we set it up for. Now the question about what to use. Um, all these medications work in one way or another at the same receptors, at a certain dose, almost all of them works the same way now. Obviously, we know that the fentanyl has a shorter lifetime. So if something if the patient doesn't react favorably to that, it takes just a few minutes or half an hour for them to come off that uh, versus you know, morphine or uh, hydromorphone that it takes much longer. Um, generally, I give a person who have never had any severe pain medication morphine, people who have been on pain medication for a long time, hydromorphone because that builds up that stronger, builds a more steady dose. And on people who are at very young or very old age, I put them on fentanyl, the side effect uh, profile in my hand has been the best. Now, let's talk about a little about adju adjuvant treatment. What is the adjuvant treatment? And I had another. Um, adjuvant treatment is um, how we can modify our whole brain to respond differently to this pain signal. In a way, you know, how, and some of them interact on the receptor level that they don't let the signal pass through. Some of them uh, literally work on the areas that uh, emotionally respond to pain. And everybody actually, meanwhile, know that the antidepressant, they work, they help in the chronic pain. And the way they uh, work uh, exactly, we don't know, but we know that they uh, modify our emotional response to pain on the, what we call a Pappus circle, the one, the slide that I showed to you, how the emotional response is generated. Anticonvulsant, anticonvulsant actually uh, has been re very recently added to adjuvant therapy because they uh, set a higher threshold for this uh, action potential to be transferred from one neuron to another. In that way, pain being just action potential, a signal, they work the same way. Um, then there are cannabinoids here. This is not political presentation. This is a scientific presentation. They work. They work on the pain perception, um, emotional response to pain. It, study after study, it, had, it has been proven they are very strong, very useful medication to, especially in the chronic pain, to help them to reduce their amount of pain medication, overall life expectancy, especially the studies are done on the AIDS HIV people. So, um, if the next time the, the uh, discussion comes up, okay, we have absolute proof that we can use it very safely and very uh, effectively in treatment of chronic pain, lots of emotional disorder, including the, the traumatic stress uh, syndrome, and other, uh, uh, and as, as you know, that there are lots of discussion going on. My guess is in the next five years, it's going to be legalized in the five to ten years for medical use in every single state, and that the way it should be. I think if I had it, if I had to choose a drug to be illegal, it would be. Uh, cigarettes and alcohol mm -hmm. than marijuana, but that's a different uh, discussion. <laughs> so, um, for certain pains, bottle toxin has been used for pain management. And then obviously now, um, we will talk a little about spinal cord stimulation later, we will just touch it, and deep brain stimulation. I talked to you about the uh, single autumn where we put a lesion. Now instead of a lesion, I, I could put a Electrode that overstimulate that area and functionally uh, paralyze it. And uh, uh, we have found that putting electrode in the brain, that what we use for Parkinson all the time, same machine, same electrode, just put it in different place, you can modify the pain or pain perception in the same group of people. And then simulotomy we talked about. 
Let's talk about some medication. Vistro. Everybody loves Vistro. Everybody uses the Epsilon Vistro. Um, what does it really do? Um, we don't really know what it does. Okay, but we know that uh, it acts on several uh, receptors in the brain and acts as an adjuvant uh, therapy. It, uh, especially in combination with morphine, it increases the effect of the morphine and it uh, uh, reduces the emotional response to pain. It is effective, but you know, um, and, and that would be another, that, that would be just a talk for itself. Um, one of my professors used to say, if it doesn't have side effect, it doesn't have any effect at all. Okay, so we all take it granted that it always works and it always good and so on, but be, uh, be aware that all these medications have their side effect. Um, I don't want to go to depth of it right now because the time wouldn't allow us. Okay, Tordol. Tordol is a very effective medication. It is uh, the, because it works on one of the uh, uh, Cox enzymes and it's very, very specific. It has not much of anti-inflammatory and other side effects uh, on the pain cascade, but it does, because it is so effective on that enzyme, it has lots of side effects on other organs, like in kidneys, like in even pulmonary system, and you know, um, in some of the in some of countries they took it off the market because people used to give it uh, unlimited a lot and uh, literally people people have died of it. And uh, in the United States, we sort of started gave it a lot, then went back, and then we are coming back to a, a good middle ground. And the good middle ground give it limited for a limited time to selected patient. And in my practice, um, I prefer to give it at least 24 hours after the surgery because like in all the other COX enzymes inhibitors, it does block the platelet ag uh, you know, uh, uh, aggregation. But that effect you know, is by far not as strong as people believe to be. So one day after the surgery, 24 hours when the capillaries are you know, uh, uh, blocked, I, it's okay to give it. And uh, I mostly limit it to two days. And when I do give it, I give it uh, permanent, I give it a schedule. I give it 30 or 50 milligram um, IV, Q6 uh, hours for, 20, for 24 to 48 hours. So if you catch somebody in your ward who has been for a uh, total IV for five days, then you just know that something is not right, okay? Just stop it. Yes? Microdiscectomies, though, mm -hmm. they could have it earlier? No, again, you know, it's a, because it's a much smaller surgery, there's no cavity there, and yes, smaller surgeries, you know, you can, they can have it. Again, this is a very effective drug. So, yes, smaller surgeries, but any surgery that I put a, a drain in, you can absolutely assume that I do not like like in the first 24 hours or until the drain is out. So the correlation is when the drain is out, most of those capillaries are filled and the drain output goes down, then it's okay to give the total. Up. Okay? So, Valium versus Flexoral. And now, we used to give them both. And, uh, now we know that uh, you know, Valium has a more general side effect, general sedation than flexoral. Flexoral actually uh, works in certain areas uh, as well of the brain, but is mostly affect the motor system. Like any other medication, yes, it does have central side effects and so on, but um, the profile um, is uh, much more advantageous for, for treat of the spasm. Now, I'm not going to go talk long about the, uh, exactly how it works, um, but it works specifically best after trauma. Um, and, it, and literature says it works for two weeks after the injury, but I don't have my data in my hand. I, I, have, I think it works much longer than that. I, uh, literature says give it only for two weeks at, in uh, conjunction with other medication. I have had pe people that you know, have been on flexoral for a month or two 
very often, uh, and then I take them off, the pain comes back. If I put them back on, pain goes away, and they go back and forth, and every time I put them back on. So um, possibly it's a good idea to give them a break between, but it does work contrary to what, I, that's my belief. I don't have the data to support that. But I do believe it works in the long, ter long term as well. Now, um, I don't believe it should be Valium versus Flexerol. It should be just Flexerol. Please, do not give my patient value, okay? It prevents them of, you know, being full aware and walking. And uh, if walking is at the end what makes my patient, my practice to get better. So Flexerol, uh, no versus no volume. And we will co come back to that. Okay, neuropathic pain. Um, gabapentin, everybody knows gabapentin, as well as the Kepra, a new seizure drug that we sometimes use for pain medication. And we talked about that all, what they work. They work at the, uh, either on the um, receptor level of the neurons or, or, or uh, synapses. They, they make it uh, more difficult for the signal to be transferred from one place to another. Okay. Neurontin is a very effective uh, drug. The only thing is that you need to be aware of it has, like any other medication, the side effect is they can become dizzy, some cardiovascular stuff. Um, in my practice, I always start very slow. I give 300 once a day, first day, and then next day I give 300 BID, third day I give 300 TID, and then I go from 300 TID, you can go all the way up to 1,200 milligram um, TID. So the usual dose is somewhere between 600 and 900 uh, three, uh, three times a day. And uh, as long as you know you go slowly up and slowly down, you know, uh, you obviously you need to go slower up, you can go faster down. It's a very safe drug, it works really good in neuropathic pain. As a general rule of thumb, you know, who want to describe what the typical neuropathic pain is like? Anybody, any takers? Neuropathic pain, what's the typical thing patient tells you? Burning. 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 Tingling. Well, yeah, tingling as well, but mostly, mostly burning or electricity-like uh, pain. It's like a jolt of electricity. Okay, we are at the, almost at the end of our presentation. Let's just you really internalize this. Pain patients are painful, not only to themselves, to, to their surroundings, to their families, to their friends, and, it, and you are no exception. They will be painful to you. But you know, if you don't want to deal with sick people, I guess you have to choose another profession. <laughs> now, uh, on the day of the surgery, I, and I invite every, every single of you to come and see one of those surgeries. I have one of those screws that I put in people's back in your hand, you know, there are uh, two to three inch big screws that I put in people's back and uh, I break their bone in 10, 15, 20 different places to take the pressure off. Um, I, I don't say the superheroes, every single of you would be in severe horrible pain. No matter what your past or future, you would be in pain. So if patient can ask for it, give it to it, give, it, give it to patient. Give it, okay? So don't uh, get into argument, but we have done, just call me, call my office, and you know, we just modify it. It is, if patient is literally able to ask for it, no, that's different than, you know, um, going shaking the patient that is barely is able to wake up and say, are you in pain? And patient is moaning, oh yeah, she's in pain. Let's give her more, this is different. If patient is clearly awake and is able to ask, say, Oh, my pain is so bad. Give me pain medication. Just uh, talk to us. Give it. Now, uh, and that comes to that the third point. is PRM for pain. It's not PRM for annoyance. And it's, we have all had those patients that, you know, you just want to not hear them for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> just the nature of what we do. And yeah, I want to I wanna give verse to all of those patients. <laughs> this is not how we roll. Okay, then uh, another thing, you know, a uh, crying wolf sort of situation, you know. Somebody who we know they abuse the system, who know they have, uh, you know, other problems and so on. And uh, as a normal human being, we ignore, we t 
tend to ignore those people, those people, you know, but um, that sometimes bad thing can happen, you know, take every concern seriously, take every, know your ABCs, know, know what you're dealing with, and this is what this uh, meeting is about, for you to get a better feeling to, to deal with those situations. And again, treat the pain, do not sedate. Morphine versus Ativan, always morphine. Well, morphine has a sedating effect as well. But Ativan has no uh, real pain effect. It just slows them down so they don't complain about it. And then uh, it's, a, it's a can of worms, just don't open it. Just, uh, sometimes we do that as well, but you know, that should be a dis another discussion. Now, empty stomach, we have had this question so many times. Empty stomach and narcotic, you are asking for ileus. Now, all this study, and I'm re just repeating myself because I had that problem this con uh, discussion with every single of you at some times. Old school was when you do abdominal surgery and open the peritoneum, you keep them in PO until the bowel uh, signs return, uh, bowel noise and gas and gas and peristaltic and so on. And that was just for abdominal surgeries. It was never an indication, never ever, ever any evidence that people who had surgery in other places should be MPO until they start uh, you know, pooping or passing gas, okay? So, but old school, the, the surgeon, they were, got so scared, they just said, okay, let's just don't feed them until they come back. And that concept is gone. Even in abdominal surgery, if you talk to your general surgeon, they are much more liberal, even when they open. For all my patients, if they are not nauseous, if uh, they, are, they are not throwing up, give them normal food. Especially empty stomach and, uh, and narcotic bring the risk of ileo significantly higher. Pass this along, because I'm sure in the next six months, I catch some of, some of my patients that have been MPO, you know, in the crucial time they need nutrition and pure for five days. Now, what is uh, my energy requirement? What's the general energy requirement of any person? Somewhere between 18 to 2,400, uh, right? What is the requirement of somebody who has gone through the surgery? Guess, guess. Yeah, we have it. We have it. Yeah. Give me a number. Three thousand. Six to seven thousand. Oh okay, no disease benefits from starvation is not a, definitely not a surgery. So, ambulation, extremely important for pain management. And the reason for that is I put certain segments together, they need pressure to find the equilibrium. No matter where you, when you do it, it will be painful. If you do it today, it will be painful. If you do it, you do it tomorrow, it will be painful. So let's do it today, not tomorrow. Ambulation, as soon as, now in certain, Cases I will let you know that you know that this patient rests for one or another. But if uh, you don't find anything in the chart and they're awake enough to get out of bed and you have time to help them out of bed, obviously not alone, get them out of the bed even half an hour after the surgery. That's the idea of what we are doing. Put screws in, stabilizing you. In the old age, we didn't put the screws in, we didn't put the interbody grafts in, and they were literally unstable. They you know. 30 years ago, it would take them really months to be even able to walk. All my patients with the instrumentation, they are stable when I lock my screws. So get them out of bed half an hour after the surgery, if you can. Um, we talked about this, uh, feeding them. Uh, and I think the, another important thing is that, at least with me, you will never get in trouble to do the right thing. Okay? so. If somebody's in pain and you know you just give me a call, what you will hear is always, yeah, give them more medication. Oh, I have done it, or and so on. You know, it is a uh, I uh, see you as a peer that you know what you are doing. But and as long as you know what you are doing and you act in the best interest of the patient, I'm, I will always support you. But know your know what you, what you are doing and ask for help. Asking for help might be just your colleague who has been doing the job for a few more years, or just literally I give my cell phone to everybody, um, just pick up the phone and call me, or call Adam, better, even better. <laughs>
<laughs> no, you can't call me. Um, okay, pain scale. That's another thing. One to ten. The scale is uh, pain, uh, patient rated. So you just gotta put down what the patient says. If the patient says my pain is nine of ten, you gotta put down nine of ten. But it's okay to say patient reports the pain nine of ten, but sitting and having zips of his teeth. That, that's an acceptable documentation. Because we have to, at the end of the day, we have to put it in perspective. Um, can you describe to me, Adam, when you had your 9 or 10 of 10 pain, how were you doing? I mean, describe your situation at that moment. I was hunched over, holding my arm, not moving a lot, and not really paying attention to what anybody else was saying. Did you have so a chocolate just... because at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, so it's a, it's, a, it's a physiological response. Pain is a physiological response. If you have such a high pain, your body literally shuts down. It concentrates on what it needs to do. If you are able to look at my eyes and have a good conversation and tell me you have 9 of 10 pain, then I put you in a different, in my mental, I put your 9 of 10 pain in a different category. It's still valid, I still act on it, but I act on it in a different category. Okay? But uh, on the other side, you know, let's go to just the other extreme. If your arm is literally falling off, it's you know, the broken here, and you tell me your pain is just uh, two or three of ten, then I'm going to look into what's going on. What other drugs do you have in you? <laughs> <laughs> Again, you know, it's all a matter of uh, you know what's going on there. Okay. Who has heard that? Doctor, I'm allergic to all pain medication, especially Tordol. Only Demerol works for me. Who has heard that? Okay. Why, why Demerol? Do you, do you want to tell us why Demerol? Well, I don't actually usually have them ask for Demerol anymore. Yeah. They're much more educated, they ask for Dilaudid. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, Demerol, it, they overused it. Yeah. They overused it, yeah. and now, but why Demerol? Because Demerol doesn't give you any euphoria. Exactly. It doesn't give you the brush. It does affect, it does treat the pain, but it doesn't, and uh, Demerol, it's a very, uh, what we call, lipophil uh, substance, meaning that it so solves itself in fat very easily. It uh, gets absorbed really, really fast. It, you take it, you, it gives you a kick right away. And that's why uh, everybody uh, that in that category who comes and ask, ask for Demerol, now they know that, oh, if I ask for Demerol, they know what I'm doing, so they don't ask for it. But five or ten years ago, that was it in the ER. Oh, that's the only thing works for me. Fifty milligrams. That's what works for me. <laughs> you know, that, that's another tip. You know, if they come and they know the dose of the medication that works for them, uh, you gotta pay attention a little more. Okay, in common term, smoke alone goes on. Non-steroidal, you cover the smoke alone. You modify the pain generation. Opioids, you reduce the vent uh, volume centrally. You modify how the signal gets transferred to the brain. Neurostimulator, that's, I'm just going to talk very quickly about it, where we put an electrode in the thoracic spine for lower extremity pain. Practically what we are doing is we over uh, casting, overshadowing the signal of the pain, like you are putting your headphone and listen to your music instead of the smoke alarm noise. And adjuvant therapy, it's, we are just distracting. We are removing the emotional response to pain, like your friend is um, literally distracting you from the noise. And if everything fails, we call the fire department, who comes and break the walls and you know put the fire out. And here, I'm the fire department. If everything, if all of that fails, they come to me, I literally break the wall and take the source of the pain away in many cases, uh, that, that source of the pain is a pressure, a direct pressure on the nerve. This is a one minute uh, video I'd like you to see. If I can make this computer do what I want it to do. But this is uh, something that we are doing here, just in this hospital, and we should be proud of. O-L-L-I-F, or OLIF, stands for Oblique Lateral Lumbar Interbody Fusion. The OLIF is a spinal fusion procedure used to treat conditions such as spondylolisthesis, degenerative disc disease, and lateral stenosis of the lumbar spine. In fact, an OLIF is used to treat all lumbar levels of the spine. An 
Olin procedure is often required when a disc is damaged or degenerated. Typically, the height of the disc is reduced, it's unstable and bulging. This, in turn, can put pressure on the nerves exiting the spine and can cause severe pain in the legs and back. This procedure is intended to reestablish the height of the disc, reduce movement of the disc, and alleviate pain. Compared to traditional spinal fusion procedures, the OLIF is a less invasive surgical technique that does not require removal of any bone or ligament structures. Equally significant, an OLIF procedure only requires a skin incision of 15 millimeters. That's smaller than a dime. First, the diseased disc is removed through a small portal that protects the skin, muscles, and nerves. After the disc is prepared and the bone wrapped material is placed, a biocompatible polymer implant is positioned in the disc space. The implant maintains the spacing of the vertebrae while the fusion takes place. This procedure is normally accompanied by a posterior fixation with pedicle or facet screws. After the fusion is complete and a solid bone mass forms, the two vertebrae are joined together. The OLIF is frequently performed as an outpatient procedure. Which is not the case in my practice. So that's complete, complete removal of the disc? Of the inner of the disc. The capsule stays in place, okay. but the inner of the disc is removed. This is something um, everybody who works in this hospital and take care of my patient, you will see that very often. And we can be proud of it because uh, we are one of very few places doing that right now. So far, more than 35 patients have come from Twin City to our Alexandria to get their procedure done. And this is, uh, this is the top line. This is, I mean, you just saw a two-minute uh, presentation of it. This is an accumulation of 35 years of research and development going into this. And uh, uh, people are, uh, right now, to my best knowledge, there are 25 to 30 surgeons in the United States doing this. And uh, none of them, we, we do here, right here, we do lots of three or four level fusion this way. Surgeries that would have taken like, you know, seven, eight hours. Last time we did a four level, it took us two hours, two and a half hours. Um, if you do it open, four or five levels of this, your blood loss is easily up to two liters, you know, half of your blood. Last time we did a minimal invasive, our blood loss was like, you know, 150 cc or something. So. This is, this is high tech, this is, you know, we are on top of our uh, field doing this here. And, uh, and this is a teamwork, uh, our, our staff has been really great. You know, literally we do one level fusion um, in 45 minutes. Um, go, go talk to around and talk to other people. If you, if you go to a, to a neurosurgeon who doesn't know of this procedure, that you can do one level fusion in 45 minutes, he won't believe you're a neurosurgeon who does this for a living. So, but the technique and the team approach allows us to do really something like that. And I think um, all of us can be proud of it. We, we are getting the benefit of it. Um, uh, now, obviously, you know, uh, we get lots of referral from other, other places, including from Twin City, from the big Twin City, now people coming for the medical care to our hospital, okay? And this is, a, and I'm uh, really proud of all of our team to do that. I mean, uh, I'm just one link in that chain, but you know, our staff and the you know, x-rays and the whole thing has really been contributing to that. And right now my schedule is full up to December, you know, before, because people from other places coming to us want to get this done, but you know, we are not going to stop there. The, the development is going. It's all about taking care of the pain. And I hope that video showed you why these people are in pain and how this procedure, this specific procedure. And I wanted you to see that because lots of those patients with the pain you will see are with this. In some places, they do let the patient go home because uh, you know, it's just a minimally invasive, smaller surgery. I don't. You will see those patients on the floor because I think at home, uh, I have uh, no way really helping patient. And I think it's just a little stretch to let the patient after, uh, f after fusion to go home. But uh, is there any question? Is there anything you want to ask or anything you want to know?
No, no question. Are they doing the, the OLAF, are they looking at trying to do that for cervical? No, we have been doing OLAF for the cervical for a very long time. It's called ACDF, which is what we do, what everybody does. And uh, it's a small surgery. It's by the nature is small enough that qualifies, especially I do it as a, uh, with a microscope. My incision is that big for the ACDF. Um, in, the, in the neck, because of the anatomy is different, we established our minimal invasive procedure 15 years ago. We do some other you know, minimal invasive stuff, but um, for the neck, the, for the similar problem, ACDF, anterior cervical discectomy and fusion is standard of care. But it, is, it does qualify, especially you know, if you do it with a, uh, with a microscope. Uh, it does qualify as a minimal invasive procedure. Any other question? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.